you have to read Rappatini's daughter sort of the way you read Mel Isaac. Well, was, was Giovanni, did he fall in love with Beatrice? Well, a kind of love, the narrator says. <laughs> the literature allows us access to the best that has been thought and said from the beginning of the Western tradition. Let me ask you first, what did those of you who wrote on Rappuccini's daughter, what did you do with it? Shaping the landscape of U.S. literary studies was not Regents Professor Ed Dryden's original intent. He just wanted to read every book in his small town library. It was a good place to start. I went to Washington College. It's a small uh, liberal arts college in Chestertown, Maryland. I took a test and was awarded uh, the senatorial scholarship from my county. The scholarship was a full one, it paid everything. Though they were poor, his parents had expectations. Both of them, from the beginning, pushed me to do well in school, and a good part of that time I disappointed them. Dryden's passion for the written word had some competition. My freshman year, it almost got me in trouble in college because uh, I could, in an afternoon, playing nine ball, make more money than my parents were able to send me uh, for my monthly allowance. But freshman English and the life of the mind prevailed. It opened my eyes to a, to a, to a new world and I had a terrific teacher. And another course that was really important to me, a course in art history, the idea that you could interpret a painting, read a painting in the same way, or in a similar way to the way you could read a poem, or that you would read a novel, was, a, was just, was just eye-opening. It made me more and more convinced that if I could find a way to spend the rest of my life working with things by way of my imagination, that that's what I wanted to do. In the early 60s, Dryden paid his academic dues in one of the most demanding English PhD programs in the nation at Johns Hopkins University. As he left Johns Hopkins for a teaching job in Buffalo, Dryden submitted a manuscript of what would become a widely recognized book on American author Herman Melville. He followed with important material on Nathaniel Hawthorne and other notable scholarship. Again, uh, that's landmark work, and he's still doing the work. I mean, he just published an, another book on Melville recently, Melville's Poetry, um, and again, not tooting his own horn. I mean, if you didn't know Ed you, well, you wouldn't or necessarily know that, that, he, that he's just published a book. The Inferno, which is an inverted triangle. I came to the University of Arizona because Ed Dryden uh, is one of the foremost Melville scholars in the world. Um, and he is my major author that I'm focusing on, and I'm also interested in 19th century American literature, so I came for Ed. Unworthiness of spirit. Okay, uh, say more about that. It's the slowing down of time in his classroom that I find really interesting and appealing and almost strange in our Twitter, Facebook culture that's constantly going. It's the patience he has with a text and also with students. So that, yeah. He's like, he's like the real deal scholar. He's absolutely to the core a scholar. Students in his classes have to learn things, have to know things, are, are really trained to look carefully at the literature that they're working with. In 1978, he was recruited to head the English department at the University of Arizona. Ten years later, he took on the leadership of the Arizona Quarterly. Under his guidance, it has become a top journal on American literature. At the time, there was a sort of felt need for a journal devoted exclusively to American literature and to American liter literary scholarship. And yeah. uh, it's worked out, I think, I think well. In the meantime, I'm flattered to have been invited to such an important event. Okay. <laughs> so we he wants to know. find out what he wants to find out what he's getting paid. And <laughs> Part of the reason for the quarterly's prestige among scholars is Dryden himself. 
Ed is a person who is infinitely curious and he is does not draw the line, oh well, this is real scholarship and this is faddish stuff. He's looking for good writing and interesting argument uh, no matter what particular critical uh, perspective is arrived. For Dryden, the romanticism of Melville and his contemporary Nathaniel Hawthorne, and all great literature, is a window that opens on to profound truths. This world, Melville says, is a world of lies. And truth, like a sacred white doe in the woodlands, is only glimpsed covertly and by snatches by Shakespeare and those other masters of the great art of telling the truth.